for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the Friday afternoon service of May the 24th, 1996, of the Memorial Day Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Norman Parrish is the speaker for the afternoon. Well, we'll turn Brother Norman loose. You are the cream of the crop. There are men and women that truly love the Lord and desire from the bottom of your hearts to serve Him. And although we have, still have our weaknesses and we still have our failures, yet I believe we're all pressing on, on to perfection. And that uh, with God's grace and with God's power, someday we will be what we earnestly desire to be. Christ-like in all our thoughts and all our acts. Now let's open our Bibles in Galatians chapter 5, and we're just going to read and study two verses. But it's surprising what you can extract from the Word of God. It's surprising what you can find as you read and reread the Word of God. As you ruminate, as you meditate, as you make an in-depth study of the Scripture, you'll find many, many facts that will absolutely surprise you. Now my message this afternoon is not going to be profound. We're going to study some of the basics about deliverance. Uh, This is supposed to be a deliverance teaching, and so I have chosen this message to because I'm. Although some of you are have been in deliverance many years, some of them perhaps are just coming in, and I don't think it's wrong for us to go over the basics. It's not wrong to go back and study the ABCs uh, because many times we can get way off in fantasy land, and we need to be pulled back to reality. There's a lot of deliverance ministries in this country that I wouldn't even recommend. I get some of the writings and I'm frightened by what they're writing. I send, I send out once in a while a little bulletin to deliverance workers and I might, lately I've been adding some of my outlines and I got a letter from somebody up here, I don't know where, Idaho, Montana, and oh, did he have a wrong spirit. And he had the attitude that he had truth cornered. I mean, he had the ultimate revelation of deliverance. He, he, in his letter, very short letter, he gave me to understand that I and many others were just novices, you know, that we were just scratching the, scratching the surface. And I wrote back and I said, yes, brother, in deliverance there are no experts. And more or less hinting that not even he was an expert as he thought he was. <laughs> because the longer you live, the more you learn about these mysteries. But the thing I've learned in deliverance, brethren, and this would be my advice to all of you is, Keep within the framework. Keep within the framework of the word. Amen. Amen. So the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this, is because the truth is not in them. And there's a lot of extra biblical teaching today, even in the uh, area of deliverance, and it's dangerous because the and the enemy can uh, reveal some things that will lead us astray, will lead us down the wrong path. And we'll get so confused and we'll get so involved in extra-biblical activity that before long we might be involved in things that are in a cultic nature. So let's go to the Word and let's see what the Word has to say this afternoon. Galatians 5.1, then Galatians 5.13. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 13, for brethren. Ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I've entitled my message, Called Unto Liberty. Called Unto Liberty. Because, brethren, one of the things I've discovered about deliverance, that deliverance is part of our high calling. You know, last night, Brother Tommy Cook talked about, uh, read a verse in 1 Peter 5.10 that says that we have been called unto his eternal glory. We've been called to so many different things. As I read the Bible, I find that we have been called 
first to eternal life. God wants to forgive us. God wants to transform us. God wants to plant within us the life of Christ. But then we've been called unto the fellowship of his Son. We've been called unto peace. We've been called unto glory. We've been called unto, uh, into the kingdom of God. But one of the important things that we've been called to is to liberate. And I'll tell you, brethren, as Christians, we should not let the enemy cheat us out of that privilege and of that right that God has conferred unto us. There are many deliverance people, people that are involved in deliverance, that have stopped short. They have not entered to, into the full measure of deliverance. Uh, I admire people that are persistent. There's two or three people around the country that I know that they've just been seeking for the deliverance month after month, year after year, year, and sometimes they can become kind of burdensome because they've been to so many different ministries that minister in so many different ways that they, they've ended up in confusion. Uh, but one thing I admire in them is persistence. Because I don't think we should give up, brethren, until we are fully and finally free from everything that would keep us from achieving our full potential in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's not, deliverance is not just going through a prayer so that three or four or five demons be cast out of us. There are many other things that we need to get rid of. Huh? And I believe that they, we can only get rid of them through a persistent for deliverance in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What about our besetting sins? Do we need to be delivered of them? Yes. Every one of us here this afternoon has a tendency toward certain sins. Now, your, your problems might be different than mine. Uh, you might have a problem with money. I might not. You might have a problem with sex. I might not. I mean, every one of us knows certain areas of weakness in our life. Uh, and we need to persist faithfully before God, seeking to be delivered of those sinful tendencies or inclinations until the power of sin is broken over our life. It's not enough to be delivered from the guilt of sin. We need to be delivered from the power of sin. Because you know that sin is what gives Satan an opportunity to work in our life. Sin gives Satan legal ground in which he can work. By sinning persistently, we are handed over to the enemy the right to harass us, to oppress us, to torment us. And as long as we uh, tolerate these besetting sins, we're going to have demonic problems. Amen? What about our habits, our addictions? Don't we need to be delivered from them? And I'm not talking only about tobacco. And I'm not talking only about alcohol. And I'm not only talking about drugs. What about a food addiction? Huh? Boy, some people are starting to get nervous this afternoon. Huh? Some of people are addicted to soda pop. They drink soda pop by the gallon. Some are addicted to candies and chocolate. What about, uh, you know, the tendency that many of us, especially Americans, have towards gluttony? They love to go to these buffets. Huh? And just eat and eat and eat till the food is coming out through the nose and out through their ears. And uh, this is an addiction that we need to be delivered. Workaholics need to be delivered. Didn't you know that? Right, an addiction to work. Uh, they don't find happiness except in hard work. Now, there's nothing wrong with work. And I think we all have to earn our keep. But some people work 16, 18 hours a day to the detriment of their health and to the detriment of their families. Amen? Don't we need to be delivered from that? Some of them need to be delivered from chronic illnesses. Oh, you know, I can assure you that there's hardly a healthy person in this building this afternoon. Every one of us has something. Some little petty illness that is not life-threatening. That's why we just let it kind of slide. Huh? And we learn to live with it. We cope with it. But brethren, uh, don't you think that little illness... If we want to classify it as little, it's included in Christ's atoning work in our behalf. He bore our sickness. He suffered our pain. And that little chronic sickness that keeps you gobbling pills by the ton, uh, that little chronic sickness uh, ought to be dealt with through deliverance and through healing. 
What about some of our soul ties? Don't we need to be delivered from all of them? Huh? Can you think of a soul tie that is affecting you at this moment? Soul ties with what? With animals? Your pets? With friends? With former lovers, former spouses? Soul ties with what? Uh, with antiques? Certain artifacts? Heirlooms? Soul ties with churches? Soul ties with, uh, well, on and on. I, we could mention many, many different soul ties. And some of us let these things just continue to weaken us and cause us to trip up time after time after time. What about ancestral curses? Have we discovered some of the things that have been passed on through our families, through the generations? Huh? Generational curses that have come upon us because of our the sinful living of our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. No, there's not a single person in this building that has not been subjected to some kind of ancestral curse. Huh? And yet, many of us have never take, made any kind of effort to discover what these ancestral curses are. You know, it could be a curse of poverty. Because someone back in past generations uh, was into usury, gave money at a high interest. Maybe somebody cheated someone else out of a, an inheritance. Or somebody, through legal maneuvering, was able to appropriate himself of property that belonged to somebody else in the family. And that brought a curse on the family, and you're living under that curse. That's why you never are able to get out of debt. You're up to your neck in debts, and you're always fretting, and you're always worrying about the financial situation. You're never, never able to live within your financial limitations. Amen? Boy, it's getting quiet here this afternoon. What about our sexual passions and deviations? Most everybody I know has some kind of sexual hang-up. You'd be surprised how many deliverance people have been on into pornography. You know, I minister on a one-to-one -one basis to many people around Central and South America, many times leaders, many times pastors. And because of my age, probably my grandfather figure, they feel, you know, confident and they open their hearts to me, perhaps or they would never open them to anybody else. And I tell you, I've seen so much garbage, it frightens me, you know. Christian leaders that have been into bestiality and into pornography and into sodomy and into all kinds of perversions. Do you have your sexual fantasies? Huh? You need to be delivered from those things because they are affecting your spiritual growth and, and your spiritual service for the Lord. Amen? What about mental disorders? Do you need to be delivered from them? Huh? Mental quirks? Some people just think wrong. I mean, their minds... Don't function like normal people, and like normal people do. They're they're so confused, they're so bewildered, their their minds are just in disarray. They're irrational in their way of thinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm just listing a few things that I wrote down here as I was sitting there. What about our doc doctrinal errors? You'd be surprised at how many of us are in error in some area of biblical truth. Well, I I don't believe there's any one of of us here this afternoon, and I include myself, that is entirely biblical in our beliefs. And we got on little tangents. We're off the, into some little tributary. And, uh, you know, I've seen people, uh, I believe in sonship, but some people in, son, in sonship frighten me. You know, they're going around trying to manifest themselves. <laughs> They don't, they're not patient enough to be manifested when God says that you're going to be manifested. The Bible says that when Christ our life appears, and that word be manifested, when Christ our life shall be manifested, we will be manifested with him in glory. That's the, the time. And even one of the great leaders of the sonship teaching that I knew well, just before he died, he said, Norman, the thing that troubles me is I just don't know when we're going to be manifested. And I said, why don't you read Colossians chapter 3? We'll be manifest when God, when Jesus will be manifested in us and through us. When Jesus comes, then we will be manifested with him in glory. Amen. And there's so many doctrinal areas in the area of healing, deliverance, sonship, etc. Et Even some of the new fangled ideas, you know. Uh, some of the newer teaching in the body of Christ in the area of faith. 
extremes into which people have fallen that has just devastated their life. I've seen people that have been irreparably hurt through some of that teaching. Uh, they've never recovered. Well, there's so many things we need to be delivered of. I've got a long list here, brethren, but I don't think we should stop short. Amen? Uh, it seems to be that we get a touch of deliverance and we think this is it. And uh, I don't think we should be chronic seekers after deliverance. Um, in one of the letters I sent out a year or two ago, I said there's people that are running all over this country from one camp meeting to another, from one seminar to another, seeking for deliverance, and they never come into it. Well, there was one man that was very prominent in deliverance circles that told me, and I think he had, this was, he was wrong, that he didn't believe that we could be fully delivered in this life. That we just had to, you know, uh, accept uh, the situation in which we live. And in his church, people were going forward for deliverance every service. And then the, and I went back two years later and three years later and four years later, and the same people were seeking deliverance from the same things that they had been seeking for year, years before. And this really troubled me, because I think we can come to a place where we can be as free as we ought to be at that moment. Now, that doesn't exclude the possibility that somewhere down the road we're going to discover something else that is deeply hidden, recessed, is that the right word? Or repressed in our, in our being that we will need to deal with. We're such complicated human beings, you know. Uh, we don't know ourselves. The only one knows us is, is God. And there's so many things down deep in our being, brethren, that I believe that God mercifully doesn't bring them to our attention all at once. I think we just go crazy. Or probably we'd, we'd go out and take our own lives. And so the Lord, little by little, reveals uh, the truth about our condition so that we can deal with it. And as time goes by, if we have enough persistence, the Lord will bring us into a full measure of deliverance that we never thought possible in this life. Now here in first, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says that we ought to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. How many read that verse? The Bible says here that we should be diligent in what? Uh, in coming into everything that God has made possible for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we have been called into liberty, let's be diligent in seeking that full measure of deliverance that can be ours in the, at this time in history. Diligence, I think, is a very important word there. Give diligence to make your calling sure. See, there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, We have been called under liberty. And the Bible says, Give diligence to make this aspect of your divine calling sure. I mean, we have to grasp it. And we have to hold it. We have to do everything we can to experience freedom uh, so that we can enjoy it and we can share it with others that are in the same or worse condition than we are. Now, as we study Galatians chapter 5, let's find out some of the facts that the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, outlines here. And the first is, is that we as Christians have a right to liberty. We have a right to be free. Amen? How many are American citizens here this afternoon? Do you know that there's a Bill of Rights? Have you ever read the Bill of Rights? Now, how many read the Bill of Rights? I think every, every American citizen should read it and study it because... In the Bill of Rights, you discover the things that you have a right to enjoy constitutionally as an, an American citizen, either born in this country or naturalized in this country. Can you think of some of the rights that have been granted unto you just by the fact of being an American citizen? Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of conscience or religion, freedom of locomotion. I mean, an American citizen is free to travel anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. Amen? You have a free to, you, you have a right to elect and be elected. You have a right to vote in local, statewide, and national elections. Now, many of the Americans don't know that they have these rights. And I think today, maybe this is the generation that is most ignorant about these rights. And that's why Americans are in danger of losing their rights. Huh? 
there's a tendency here in America in the last 20, 30 years to remove these rights, to, to cancel out these rights. And a lot of uh, Christians and non-Christians are not aware of these dangers that uh, uh, you can, America could fall into a totalitarian state where the state uh, regulates the life of its citizens. I've lived under dictatorships in Guatemala in years past where you couldn't, you couldn't leave the country without going to ask for permission to leave the country. You had to put your passport in several days before. And if they had you on the black list, I mean, they would make it impossible for you to leave the country. Many times during those dictatorships, we have to go to the local or state uh, uh, officials to ask for permission to have a convention. According to the, the law, uh, they could, you can have a meeting of more than five people at one time. The country is under state, state of emergence or under state of siege. And so uh, when, when people ignore their rights and are not willing to claim them and are not willing to defend them, they can easily what? Lose them. Now, one of your rights as a Christian, as a born-again spiritual Christian, is the right to be free. Amen? The Bible says, ye are called unto liberty. But this is not something that we should take for granted. Something so precious that we should be willing to fight for it. Amen? Amen? Okay. First Thessalonians 5.24. How many have read this? Faithful is he that hath called you... What? Who will also do it. Okay. If God has called us unto liberty, what does this verse say? Uh, that he will make it possible. That he will do it. That he will provide it. It's, it doesn't depend on our faithfulness. It depends on whose faithfulness? On God's faithfulness. God is faithful. He has promised. He will fulfill his promise. Amen. He has offered. He will keep his offer. The Bible says that we have been called under liberty, and if we are honest and we are sincere with God, God will do everything by his Spirit that needs to be done so that we can come into that full freedom of the children of God. Amen? Now, let's read Romans 8.21. And this is an end-time passage of Scripture that Brother Tommy alluded to yesterday. And it says here in verse 21, because of the creature itself, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of whom? How many are children of God? How many are sons of God here this afternoon? In our Spanish translation, it doesn't say children of God, it says sons of God. And we as sons of God born into the family of God have the right to be free. And let we should let man or, or Satan cheat us out of that right. Amen? Uh, liberty belongs exclusively to the sons of God. Amen. Amen. How many remember the story of the woman with spirit of infirmity? Luke chapter 13. What did Jesus say? Ought not this daughter of Abraham, who lo these 18 years has been what? <coughs> Bound by Satan. Ought not she have been loosed on this Sabbath day? She was a daughter of Abraham. And as a daughter of Abraham, she had a right to be what? To be free. Now, how many of you are... Our daughters and, and sons of Abraham. Raise your hand. In Galatians 3.29 it says, If ye be Christ, ye are children of Abraham. And as such heirs of the promise. By faith in Jesus Christ we have become sons and daughters of Abraham. He is the father of faith. He is the father of all them that believe. So the Bible says that only those that are of faith, they are the children of Abraham. It's not a racial relationship. It's a spiritual relationship. You know, we've, we've uh, what we say, we've, evangelical Christians have, have kind of uh, cheated themselves out of many of the privileges we have because we have been able, willing to hand all these blessings to Israel in the natural, to the Jewish nation. But brethren, today... By scripture, we find that these the things that God promised Abraham belong also to whom? To us. Did you know that healing was in the Abrahamic covenant? Huh? Many people don't know that. And because they don't know it, they don't claim it. But here in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm just going to show you that. Because I'm a firm believer not only in divine healing, I'm a firm believer in divine health. 
Like I told you last night, I walked in divine health for 22 years till I got attacked two weeks ago up in the Northwest. And I haven't surrendered. I mean, I've stood it on healing grounds. And I haven't canceled an appointment. I haven't canceled a meeting. And I've been ministering, going a week in state. But listen to what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verse um, 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant. Listen to that word. The covenant and the mercy which he swore unto whom? Thy fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then notice what it says in verse 15. And the Lord will take away from thee what? All sickness. Do you know that healing was part of the Abrahamic covenant? And that by faith in Jesus Christ you become an heir of Abraham. Heir, heir of these covenantal blessings. And you have a right to be free of all illness, even those petty chronic illnesses that are troublesome, although they're not life-threatening. And you should stand on the, on the grounds uh, of this covenant and demand your healing. And not only demand, but expect your healing. Amen? And not drag yourself through life 15, 20, 25, 30 years with some disease that is keeping you from enjoying life to the fullest extent. Amen? So, the Bible says here that we as children of God have a right to be free, and that includes free from freedom from oppression, freedom from sickness, freedom from poverty, freedom from everything that is of a troublesome nature that keeps us from living uh, the Christian life the way that God would have us live in this generation. How many read the story of the Syrophoenician woman? When Jesus was talking there about healing and deliverance, he called deliverance the children's bread. And to what children was he referring to? The children of Abraham. Huh? To the children that are part of this great covenant that God made with Abraham, our father. And we have a right to eat this bread and to enjoy this bread. But many of us are being cheated out of these blessings, brethren, because we haven't stood up and claimed them. We haven't understood that this is a right that we have to enter into by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, Daniel 12, 2 is a prophetic passage, and I'm going to ask you to turn there. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it's talking about the end times. Let's read verse 1 first. And it shall be, excuse me, and at that time, at the time of the end, at the end of this age, shall Michael stand up. Do you know that in the end times, God said that there will be a a great deal of angelic activity that the angelical the angelic ministry will be restored to the church. Have you read the book of Acts? Have you found how many times angels intervened in the lives of God's servants in the first century of the church? Now, I believe that there's going to be a renewal of this angelic activity in the days that precede the coming of Jesus Christ. Michael, that great archangel, that great prince, will stand up. He's been in the state of Sort of inactivity. He's been just sitting waiting for order. And he's going to stand up and enter into warfare against the powers of darkness. You can read about this battle in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Now notice what it says then. The great prince would stand us for the children of people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even up to that, to that same time. Now I don't know what your eschatological beliefs are. Many Christians, many, most Christians, believe that the church is not going through tribulation. And I think they're deceived. Because I believe that, my personal conviction is that there's nowhere in the Bible have we been promised to be spared from tribulation. In fact, there's many warnings that say that we must go through much or through great tribulation into the kingdom. Uh, Tommy talked about suffering to glory. Uh, tribulation is the way into the kingdom of God. And yet, this is a very popular teaching. There are still books printed by the thousands. John Hagee just recently uh, published a new book, and I read parts of it, and it's just the same old pre-tribulational viewpoint rehashed. Huh? And I'll tell you, brethren, I think the church of Jesus Christ, especially in America, is not prepared for what is coming. Because we think we're going to be swept to into the sweet by and by and that we're going to be sitting on clouds of glory looking down on the earth while God's wrath is being poured out upon humanity. Don't confuse tribulation and wrath. That's one of the most common mistakes. Tribulation is one thing. Wrath is an entirely different thing. God said we have been saved 
from wrath. We've been kept from wrath. I don't think the church is going to experience the wrath of God. Huh? But before the wrath of God is poured out upon humanity, uh, Satan's wrath is going to be poured out upon the church. That's the great tri tribulation period. Tribulation is for the church, not for the unbelieving world. And the church is going to go through tribulation. But notice what I said, it's going to go through. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to be saved in tribulation, not from tribulation, but in tribulation. Like Daniel was saved in the lion's den, and like the three Hebrew children were saved in the fiery, what is it called in English? Fiery, fiery furnace. Okay? Well, I don't want to get sidetracked, but the Bible shows here that in the end time, in the time of, of great distress, in the great time of great trouble on the face of the earth, that the church is going to have to go through, then it says, and at that time thy people shall be delivered. Do you understand why deliverance is just being restored to the church during the last 20, 30, 40 years? It's a relatively new doctrine. Back in the 50s, no one preached deliverance. Uh, it, it, in, in the early 60s, God began to raise up men to preach the truth of deliverance. Maxwell White, who used to come to Lake Hamilton, was one of the first ones to preach deliverance. And then we others are, were raised up in the body of Christ, like Derry Prince and like Frank Hammond and and others that God has used in, in this area of truth. But deliverance is relatively new to the body of Christ. Oh, they used to use the term back in the healing days, you know. In the great healing campaigns, they would call healing deliverance. But healing deliverance are two different things. Huh? You understand, brethren? Okay. And it's, but it says here that at that time, at the time of the end, and you notice that sandwiched in between the tribulation period in verse 1, and the resurrection of the dead in verse 2, in that, at that time, thy people, everyone that is written in the book of life, shall be what? Delivered. I believe that, brother, deliverance, instead of waning and instead of disappearing, is going to be, come to the forefront again in the very near future. Right now, the body of Christ is being sidetracked into what we call strategic spiritual warfare. There's a lot of eminent Christians that are holding seminars and writing books about strategic warfare, uh, that were, you know, were attacking the powers of evil in the heavenlies, that at long range were sending out spiritual missiles. I mean, and, and I've read some of the writings and they look down on deliverance. We are the foot soldiers. We're fighting with bayon, ba, 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 bayonets, or how do you call that? Ba, bayonets and with... Uh, submachine guns or machine guns. But they've got these tremendous missiles that they're shooting at the powers that are in the heavenly sphere. Brethren, I'm not against strategic spiritual warfare. But I believe you can't do strategic spiritual warfare without doing deliverance. In fact, I think that the effectiveness of strategic spiritual warfare depends on deliverance. Because have you read there in Luke chapter 10 when the 70 came back just jubilant. They were bubbling over. Uh, they were excited. They said, you know, Lord, even the devils were subject unto us in your name. And what did Jesus say? While you were out there on the field ministering to people on a one-to-one -one basis, casting out demons, I saw something happen up in the heavenlies. He says, I had a vision. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. See, deliverance has an impact not only in the local plane, but in the heavenly sphere. Amen? Deliverance itself not only benefits the person that's going through deliverance, will benefit his family, his community. Uh, it will tear down the powers of evil over cities and areas, and even entire countries. But most people don't understand that today. Now, what I want to show you here, brethren, is that those that are written in the book of life have a right to be what? To be free. Amen? Freedom is available to them through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But as everything else, we have to come into that through repentance, through obedience, by taking the steps that God has established so that we can experience and we can enjoy the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Now, in the second place, we're going to talk about the source of liberty, the origin of liberty, the author of liberty. And who is he? 
Jesus Christ. You can find the answer right there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, stand fast in the liberty with which what? Christ has already made us free. See, Jesus paid the price 2,000 years ago. Uh, freedom has, made, has been already won, and freedom has already been made available to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is our liberator. How many can praise his name? Amen. Amen. In John 8, 36, it says, If the Son sets us free, or sets you free, ye shall be free what? Indeed. You know what the word indeed means? In truth. In reality. Yeah. In truth, in reality. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not just a supposition. It's something factual. It's something real that we can take and appropriate. Something that we can experience. The liberty that Christ obtained for us through his death and resurrection. Then we read there in John 8, uh, 20, 32, it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But what is truth? Pilate asked that. And truth was standing right in front of him. Because Jesus said, I am the truth. Amen. So as we know the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can only know the Lord Jesus Christ through the pages of this book, as the Holy Spirit reveals the person of Christ through Scripture, uh, that we can come into freedom. Amen? The Bible, the, the Bible says, Thy word is true. And it's the written word and it's the living word uh, that sets us free from all our bondages. Amen? Now, don't you think that because for, for deliverance is free, that it's cheap? And I think many Christians have made that mistake. Deliverance doesn't cost us a great deal. It might take a day of fasting or two or three seeking God earnestly to be set free from some of our bondages. But listen to this. Jesus paid a frightful price for our deliverance. Amen. That's the cost of our liberty. It was a high cost. Because Jesus had to give what? He had to give up his glory, first of all. He had to give up all his divine rights and give up all his divine virtues and give up all his divine attributes in order to become man, 100% man. He emptied himself. You know that he had to set aside temporarily, voluntarily, all his divine attributes in order to become a man? Amen. He, could, he never ceased being God. But all his divine powers and attributes were set aside temporarily so that he could live the life of a, of a man. You know that Jesus in the days of his flesh wasn't omnipotent? Well, you're quiet this afternoon. He depended on the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything he did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he could say later, the works that I do, ye shall do also. Because the same Holy Spirit that was available to him is available to us. He didn't walk on the waters because he was God. Then Peter was deified when he walked on the water. He didn't calm the storm because he was God. Boy, some of you are not agreeing with me right now. But let me tell you something. He was God, but he never availed himself in the days of his flesh of his divine powers and attributes. He depended 100% on the Holy Ghost, as we ought to depend on him. Amen? So, Jesus had to empty himself of everything. The word for empty in Spanish is, he became nothing. After being everything, he became what? Nothing. Se anonado means he became nothing. In order to become a man. Because man is a, is a nothing. Even David said, I'm a worm. And he wasn't just speaking poetically. He realized that he, without God, was totally useless, worthless. Amen? Amen? Now, being a man, what did he have to give in order to bring us into this eternal redemption? Huh? Everything. He kept on humbling himself. He kept on emptying himself until he went to the cross and he had to lay down his life. He gave his blood, he gave us all, he gave everything he could give in order that we could be set free. Didn't you know that deliverance is connected directly with the atoning work of Jesus Christ? With his the redemption that he achieved at Calvary? It's right here in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. There's deliverance. Deliverance means to set free, to loose, to untie. Jesus gave himself everything he had, everything he was. He gave it 
freely to deliver us. Now it says here, deliver us from this present evil world. Do you know that the world is, that the Bible is referring to here is the world system that is under the control of whom? Of Satan. Satan has the whole world under his grasp, is under his control. He is the prince of this world. The Bible says that the world is the spirit. First Corinthians 2, 12 says that God has not given us the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is of God. The world is the spirit. And brethren, it's the spirit that dictates in the, uh, today. Every time you turn your television on, you're being subjected to the spirit of the world. Those talk shows, those sitcoms, those horror movies, all of that's part of the spirit of the world. And brethren, when we spend hour after hour sitting behind before the tube, boob tube, we are subjecting ourselves to that spirit. And it's going to affect our spiritual lives. It's going to debilitate. It's going to corrupt our spiritual lives. And you'd be surprised how many demons have entered people just by sitting and looking at television. And I mean, we need to discriminate. And we need to exercise proper control over our television set. If we have one. Okay? So brethren, what did Jesus pay for our freedom? Have you read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15? It says that in so much as the children partook of what? Flesh and blood. He partook of the same. He became a man. He, he was not just a, a semblance of a man. He, he didn't have the appearance of a man. He was a man. Amen. He became flesh. He took upon himself a human body. And what does it say there? To destroy through death, his death at Calvary, him that had the power over death, that is whom? The devil. And notice what verse 15 says. In order to deliver them that were held all their lifetimes in bondage through the spirit of fear of death. Amen? Uh, Satan can use just about anything to keep us in bondage. But there are people that all their lifetimes have been kept in bondage uh, because they have never discovered the truth of deliverance. Even Christians sitting in those pews Month after month, year after year, are in bondage. You know that the church of Galatia was in bondage? A spirit of legalism, a religious spirit had invaded the church. Some Judaizers had appeared on the scene, and they were trying to put the church in bondage to the law. Amen? And I tell you, there's a lot of religious spirits in our churches today. All the way from legalism to dogmatism to sectarianism to denominationalism to traditionalism to ritualism to mysticism, etc., etc. The religious demons. And they rob us of our freedom in Christ Jesus. And we should fight those spirits. And we should rebuke those spirits. And we should command those spirits to leave our groups and to leave our churches. Because they are spoiling us, stripping us of the freedom that is ours through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at another point here in Galatians chapter 5. The purpose of deliverance. Why does God set us free? Why is he willing to go to so much trouble to set us free? And it, the answer is found in verse 15, uh, 13. Brethren, we have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. See, some people use liberty as an excuse for license. Amen? They use the liberty to indulge in their sinful nature. But that's not the purpose of deliverance. What is the purpose of deliverance? But by love serve one another. Why are, does God want to set us free? So that we can serve him and that we can serve our brethren and that we can serve the human race in this generation. You know that somebody who's bound by evil spirits cannot serve. That's why 80, 90 percent of people go to church today serve for nothing. You can't get them to, to do anything in church. They always have an excuse. There's always, pastors here know that there's always a shortage of qualified workers. Nobody wants to work in the nursery. Nobody wants to teach in Sunday school. Nobody wants to sit on some committee, building committee, or whatever they have to have to improve their facilities. It's hard to get people involved in church today. Why? Because they're what? Ah. See, God wants to deliver us. Galatians 5.13. We are delivered to serve and serve by love, not out of any how would we say, material gain. Not for selfish reasons. Not for profit. Not to gain uh, stature or gain admiration in the sight of the people. You know, it's out of love. Pure love. Let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 74. You might say we're rehashing the same old things. Well, these things can be easily forgotten, brethren. 
And we need to bring them to our attention time after time after time. It says here, and it's talking again about the Abrahamic covenant. It says that he would grant unto us that we being delivered. There it is again. Delivered out of the hand of whom? And who are our enemies today? Satan and his demons. Now God wants to deliver out of the, uh, out of the hands of Satan and his demons so that we might serve him. That's what it says here. That we delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. You know that deliverance precedes holiness. You know why many people never come into holiness? Although they cry and groan, uh, they come to the mourner's bench and they spend hours mourning before the Lord and they never come into holiness. Why? Because they've never been delivered. Huh? They've never been delivered from sin and its consequences. They've never been delivered from the power of sin. They've never been delivered from the demons that have entered their life or entered their family through wrongful living. Amen? Now, the Bible says here that God would grant us. This is a privilege. This is a right that God has granted us that we being delivered out of the hands of all our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our lives. Why are we being delivered? Why does God want to set us free? That we might serve him. Amen. How can many can praise his name? That we might serve him. And there are many instances of this. How many remember the story of Lazarus? Huh? He, was, he was brought back to life. He was quickened. He was resurrected. But when he came out of the grave, how was he? Bound completely. Head and foot. He couldn't walk. He could just kind of... He couldn't move his hands. He couldn't move his lips. All he could do was mumble like any mummy would. And what did Jesus say to those that were around him? Loose him and let him go. But once he was free, did you know that God used him to save many souls? Many people came to see Lazarus and left convinced of the power of God. And they became disciples. They became followers of Jesus Christ. Lazarus became an instrument in God's hand, a mighty instrument to win others to Christ. I'm going to remember the story of that little donkey that Jesus rode in his triumphant entry to the city of Jerusalem. Remember Jesus sent some of his disciples ahead to find transportation? He said, at a certain place, at the crossroad of certain roads, there, you'll find a little donkey tied to a post. What did he say? Well, loose him first. And if anybody argues and anybody complains, just say, the master has need, a need of him. But, what, they, what Jesus said, you loose him, set him free, and bring him. Uh, could that donkey be of any service to Jesus Christ as long as he was tied to that lamp post? Could. And that's what's happening to so many Christians today. They have abilities, they have talents, but they can't use them in, in church, or they can't use them for the benefit of the kingdom. Why? Because they are what? Bound by evil spirits, and they need to be set free. This is the purpose of our deliverance, is to serve God. And if you have no intentions of serving God, don't waste your breath and don't waste your effort to get free. Just keep your demons. But in order to serve God effectively, we have to be set free. But many of the things that we mentioned at first, any personality disorder will keep us from serving God. Any evil habit will keep us from serving God. And even if we try, our service will not be effective because of our character, because of our behavior. We'll just tear down everything we try to do for God because we are bound and afflicted by evil spirits. Now let's look at another uh, point here. Galatians chapter uh, 5 verse 8. This persuasion cometh not of him that calls you. We're going to find out who is the enemy of our liberty. Who is the one that opposes our liberty and tries to keep us from entering into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. You know Satan is not mentioned by name in Galatians in the book of Galatians. But he says, this persuasion is not of him that called you. Who called us? God called us out of darkness into light. Amen? And Paul says here, this persuasion is not of God, so it must be of whom? Of Satan. And Satan is the one that through devious means tries to keep us from experience in deliverance and then keep us from living in the freedom that Christ has made possible for us. He has many different tactics, tactics that he uses against us. For example, here in Galatians 5, several are mentioned. Verse 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you? I like that word in Spanish. In the old Spanish 
translation which I use, and some people say, why do you keep using the old King James Version? Why do you use the old Cipriano de Valera Version in Spanish? I said, because I'm old, and it's hard for us oldies to change. And yet, I believe that the older translations are still the most accurate translations. Amen. Uh, because they were men, written by men that didn't have prejudice. And that were they're not trying to mold the Bible to their own personal beliefs. And notice what it says here. It says, hinder. In Spanish, it says, embarazar. Let's see, Brother Jack. Do you know what embarazar means? To make pregnant. To impregnate. Uh, a woman that is pregnant uh, loses a lot of her freedoms, doesn't she? How many mothers and grandmothers do we have here? Well, you can't be a grandmother without being a mother. Okay? So, uh, what, what, can you remember the days when you were pregnant, especially the last two, three, four, five weeks? Weren't you miserable? Huh? You could hardly turn her over in bed. That big pot belly made it nearly impossible. You had to kind of move it over. Huh? Your husband had to help you sometimes with certain chores. Huh? Could you jump and run like you used to as a teenager? No. Could you climb stairs? Could you climb a tree? No. See, that, that creature uh, that you had inside, that son, that daughter, in, 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 the, in that stage of formation would hinder you from doing certain things that were so natural and so easy before you become, became pregnant. Amen? Well, demons do the same thing to us. And some of us are impregnated by evil spirits. And they hinder us. They keep us from you know, living our Christian life and with the joy and with the peace that God would want us to. For example, there in First uh, Thessalonians 2.11 to 18, I, I know my Spanish Bible better than I do my English uh, Bible, but it says here, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And again in the Spanish Bible it says, Satan I just, uh, impregnated us. I don't know what other word can you get in English that would, would uh, but he, he, he's hindering us by, you know, Barring the way for us to do what God wants us to do. For example, in Second Timothy chapter 2, where it says uh, that uh, the soldier of Jesus Christ uh, endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that worth entangle himself. There in Spanish again, it's the word embarazar. We don't let ourselves be entangled. We don't let ourselves be ensnared. We don't let the enemy impregnate us, even with things that look so innocent. Like the affairs of this life. Uh, there are other verses in Scripture. For example, in Luke chapter 21, verse 34, it says that we should not be overcharged with the cares of this life or this world. All this shows that Satan can use things that are so pleasing, are so innocent looking, to what? To hinder us. Uh, to hinder us from enjoying our freedom and experience our freedom to the fullest extent of the word. Now, another thing that Satan does, according to Luke, uh, Galatians 5, chapter, verse 5, verses 10 and 12, is, it says, But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. 12, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. Satan uses his minions. Certainly, Satan uses his cohorts, demons, to what? To trouble us. To affect our minds. To affect our, our nerves. To keep us in a state of what? Of confusion. Eh? In a state of kind of like an uproar. Uh, he destabilizes emotionally and uh, mentally so that we're not able to serve the Lord effectively. Then, for example, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says that he wants to put us under the yoke of bondage. You know what? Where, where, do, where do they place the yoke? How many were grew up on a farm way back 30, 40, 50 years ago? Uh, did you have oxen? Guatemala, we used to have thousands of ox carts. Uh, through the streets, you know. And uh, now they've been replaced by these little Japanese pickups. But where do, where do they place the yoke on, on the, the either on the horses or on the oxen? Here in the neck. Okay. Do you know where our wills are localized, located? Now, here, our spirit dwells here. This is the spiritual heart. There, there's a, a very intricate nerve system here called the solar plexus. If you get punched there, kicked there, stabbed there, you're dead. This is the center of life. That's why the Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of, rivers of living water. In it from your innermost being. This is where our spirit dwells. When you have a strong emotion, where do you feel it immediately? Right there. 
behind your belly button. Now, where is your mind located? Up here. Don't confuse your mind with your brain. The brain is just an organ. It's a storage unit. The mind is spiritual. It's part of your soul. And that's why the Bible says that we need to be renewed in the spirit of what? Of our mind. The mind is a spiritual element that is encased in our brain. Amen? When you die, the brain goes to the, to the sepulcher, but your mind is part of your soul, uh, continues living. Amen? Well, you're quiet. And I don't think you're agreeing with me. But do you know where the will is located? Right here. Huh? That's why scores of times in the Bible says, ye stiff-necked people. What is he referring to? You rebellious, you stubborn, you obstinate people. Now let me ask you, how many of you suffer from a tightness here? Pain, pain. How many? Let me raise your hands. You know, some of them, this is chronic. Some people suffer from that constantly. That's because you're stubborn, my brother, my sister. You're in opposition to spiritual authority. You, you don't submit to the authority of your parents. You don't submit to the authority of your husband. You don't submit to the authority of your pastor. You, you Americans just brag about the fact that they're independent. I'm an individualist. I'm free. I do whatever I want. I go where I want. I do what I want. Nobody lords it over me. Why are you so good? Some of you are... <laughs> you're beginning to discover what your problem is. Amen? See, the enemy wants to put a, a yoke of bondage so that he can control us, so that he can dominate us, so that he can obligate us to do what we wouldn't normally do in our when we're in full control of our mind. Amen? That's part of his scheme. That's one of his tactics to keep us in bondage is to take control of our minds, take control of our wills, so that we're not able to be free. And if we're not free, we're of no useful value to the kingdom of God. Amen. Then notice what it says here in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You know, that's another one of Satan's tactics. By the use of witchcraft, by the use of sorcery. The, the, not only, listen, Galatians was not a church. It was a group of churches in the province called Galatia. And they all been in, infiltrated by witches. And from the inside, they had been put under a curse of witchcraft. Chapter 2, verse 4 says that because of the false brethren that have slipped in unawares, and what was their purpose? To spy out our liberty to put us in the bondage. Witchcraft was being worked on the, in, in the churches of Galatia. And that's happening today. Let me tell you what happened in, in I was in Washington State. I had a, a Sunday of deliverance, three deliverance services on Sunday. We culminated with a mass deliverance. And I noticed that Sunday night there was a young man standing, well, maybe 30, 35, standing at the back by the, by the uh, PA system. And he was there, like mumbling, like praying. And I didn't know who he was, but I, I, I noticed. That night's when I came down sick. That night's when I was just blasted. And, and the next day I uh, felt weak and miserable. I had a free day, so... I stayed in the pastor's home, and in the early afternoon, I, I said, I'm going to go and rest for a while. And when I, all of a sudden, when I was, woke up with a, with a start, and I saw the image of that young man. And so I got up and I asked the pastor, who was that young man that was standing by the door? He said, I don't know. Who, I mean, by the PA system. He said, I don't know who he is. I've never seen him before. And I said, that's the source of the trouble. Uh, in the morning, I talked about the new age. And there's a lot of New Agers in that area. And somehow the news got around, and I'm sure they sent that young man. I'm sure they put, he was planted there to oppose the meeting and to probably speak some curses on the church, on the pastor, and even on the visiting speaker. And I had to battle that for probably a week or more. I believe it was a, witch, it was a curse that was placed upon me. Naturally, I was in a weakened condition. I had just come from Guatemala. I faced this ordeal with my adopted son, Peter, this terrible battle in the spirit, and I'd lost 15, 18 pounds, and it, I was just, it, it was the right moment for Satan to get socket. But the Lord showed me by the revelation of the spirit that this problem came through witchcraft that was performed right inside the church building. Huh? Don't think your family is immune, and don't think your church is immune. Any church that's doing anything for God today is going to be invaded by Amen. practitioners of the occult sciences and the magical arts. And they're going to work from the inside 
to tear that work down. Amen? This is a plan that the New Agers and others have to destroy the Church of Jesus Christ. They know that the only institution in America today that's keeping this country from being overrun, this country being taken over by the Antichrist forces, is the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So we see Satan's tactics. And brethren, we should study his tactics. I mean, I just mentioned a few. Hinder, trouble, deceive, bewitch, etc., etc. But brethren, the, the Bible is full of information about the tactic that you, Satan uses to bring us into bondage. And brethren, if we don't understand the workings of the enemy, we'll be easily prey. We'll be easy prey. We'll be the next victims of Satan's attacks and Satan's onslaughts. Now let's look at another point quickly because my time is going. In uh, chapter five, five, we're going to find to study about the loss of our liberty. Do you know that we can lose our liberty? Uh, the Bible warns us constantly about that possibility. Here in chapter five, verse one, it says, "Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again, be not burdened again with the yoke of bondage." See, there's that possibility that no matter how much deliverance we might have gotten through the year we could always fall back uh, into a state of captivity. How many read uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45? It says, When the evil spirit has gone out of a man, he goes to dry, to waste places, seeking for rest, and finding none, he says, I'm going to go back to what? To my house. He still claims property rights. And he comes back and inspects the house. And he finds the house beautiful. It's been swept, it's been painted, it's been garnished. It's been decorated, but it's empty. It's empty. And what does he do? He says he escaped once, but he's not going to escape twice. I'm going to secure this house. So he goes and invites seven other demons that are worse than he. They're more cruel. They're more persistent. They're more astute. Whatever you want. And when they come, they enter that house. The latter condition is what? Worse than the former condition. You know, it's easier to deal with them. Somebody that's unsaved than somebody that's backslidden. They are doubly the children of the devil. And I'll tell you, brethren, deliverance is something that you should value because if you lose it, the next time it's not you're not going to get it as easy. Uh, when people come the second, the third time with the same problems, you know, what I say, okay, fast three days, fast seven days, and then come. Some of them never show up. Uh, they want a magic wand waved over them and and I don't waste my time with people that are not willing to treasure, to value what God has done for them. Sometimes I'll give them a list of 25, 30 scriptures that have to do with spiritual warfare and deliverance. And I say, learn these by memory. And when you learn and know them, uh, you know them by memory, come and recite them. And if you, then I will pray for you. They never come back because they want it easy. For brethren, deliverance is costly. Like we saw, saw before, Deliverance cost Jesus Christ everything. And if we don't value our deliverance, we're going to lose it. And Satan's going to recapture the ground that he's lost in us. I mean, yes. Second Peter 2, 9, 19 through 21 talks about this also. And I, let me just read those verses quickly. It says, while they, promise them, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of a man of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, and the world is a spirit, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That's talking about the same thing. If you're entangled again by the spirit of the world, and you fall back into your spiritual, your worldly amusements, and your worldly styles, and your mus worldly musical preferences, etc., etc., then it's going to get much harder to get yourself free. Amen? Amen? Because your latter condition is worse than your former condition. See, we need to defend our freedom. That's another point. We need to defend it. And that's why in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast. Stand firm. Do you know that's a military term? It's talking about warfare there. The enemy is going to try to come and snatch your liberty. Huh? He's going to try to bring you again into bondage. And what are you going to have to do? Stand. Now, Peter over the phone this week told me that the witch doctor with whom he seems to have been associated 
has been appearing to him. And this, this witch doctor has what you call out of the body experience. He has astral projection or cosmic flight. And at night, he appears to him and he speaks to him and he threatens him. And I say, son, you're going to have to stand and you're going to have to stand up and rebuke that thing and command that thing to leave you alone. Whether it be a demon or, the, or a human spirit, I don't know. But I said, you're going to have to begin to fight for your survival. That's why in Ephesians 6, you know that chapter is one of the most important chapters on spiritual warfare you can find in the Bible. Four different times it says, stand, stand, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Even if we burn all our ammunition, we should be willing to stand. We can't turn, we can't run, we can't hide, we can't give our turn our backs on the enemy. We have to stand. How many have seen the guards of the Buckingham Palace in, in London. I don't know if you've been over there or if you've seen them over television, but they stand on guard. I mean, they don't even bat an eye. And in the hot summer months, some of them keel over. They just faint. Uh, but they won't move an inch. They're like statues. And that's what God is calling us to do. To resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, we are called to resist Satan in full assurance of faith that if God is with us, that God's going to protect us and that God is going to defend us. But it takes a standing. And it's, it's a determination on our part that we're going to be free and once we are free we're not going to let the enemy strip us of our freedom in Jesus Christ. Now the last point I want to bring to your attention today in this message is the agent of our liberty or of our freedom. Who is the agent? We talked about him last night the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Brother Tommy was reading there in uh, Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. liberty. Who makes liberty available to us? It's the Holy Spirit that takes the things of Christ, the things that Christ did for us on Calvary 2,000 years, and brings them to us and applies them to us. Amen? That's what John chapter 16, verse 15 says, that he will take the, my things and make them known unto you. But the word known there doesn't talk about intellectual knowledge, but it talks about experiential knowledge. Amen? God wants us to experience deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can read all, throughout the Bible, for example, Isaiah 10, 27, it says that the anointing, and refers to the anointing of the Spirit, is the one that breaks, destroys the yoke of bondage that Satan has placed upon us. In Isaiah 58, 6, it says, isn't this the fast that I have chosen? And what does it say? To break the yoke of bondage. Fasting releases the anointing of the Spirit. And I tell you by experience, brethren, there will not, there's nothing that will hasten your deliverance more than fasting. We associate it, we always associate fasting with deliverance. And nearly invariably, I will ask people that come for deliverance to fast. In fact, if I have a three-day seminar, I'll tell the people that want deliverance to start fasting immediately. So that when we minister deliverance, either in private or in public, either personally or in mass, that the, the fasting will break the yoke of bondage and will, will release the anointing of the Spirit of God in their lives so that they can be free without a great struggle. If I pray for somebody and we pray 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and we don't see much happening, I'll say, okay, right now, start a fast. Start fasting. And many times I'll say, now fast with you. And I'll tell you, brethren, within 24 hours, 48 hours, those demons come tumbling out of there. They flee. They're panic-stricken. Because there was nothing that will release the power of God in your life as fast as fasting. Now, let me ask you, and I'm not trying to embarrass any, how many of you fast on a regular basis? At least one day a week. One day a week. Six or eight people. You don't even make good Pharisees. How many days a week did the Pharisees fast? two days a week. And I know we're not under the law, but under grace, that it would be good for our health and our spiritual being for us to fast on a regular basis at least one day a week. It will help our health and it certainly will help our spiritual tone. Amen? Are you going to try it? You, you should study on what the Bible says about fasting. It's one of the most potent weapons that we have against Satan. When I am weak physically, and that can become as a result of fasting, then I am, what did Paul say? I am I'm strong spiritually. Now, we nurture the flesh. We take too much 
too good care of the place and our spiritual life goes down the tube. I think we need to begin to fast so that spiritually we'll be strong to resist all the attacks of the enemy no matter where they come from. And you can read all the other verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to set at liberty them that are bruised, them that are broken, those them that are oppressed. You read in Matthew chapter 12, 28, If I by the Spirit of God cast out devils, how does deliverance come? It's by the Spirit. Even Jesus had to be, had the experience the anointing of the Spirit so that he could cast out devils. He never cast out a demon before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit by, by the river Jordan. Uh, he had to wait until he was endued with power out from on high to confront the enemy and defeat the enemy. Acts 10, 38 talks about Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Ghost in power, who went about doing good and what? Healing, delivering all those that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. The anointing is an evidence of the presence of God in your life. God is present in our life and ministry through the anointing. And brethren, nothing will release the anointing faster in our lives, homes, and churches than, you know, fasting on a regular basis. Seeking God through fasting and through prayer. See, God wants us free. How many believe that? And he has conceded us the right to be free. He has granted us the privilege and the right as children of God to be free. But I, I can say, and I'm not exaggerating, that most of us in this building still have areas in our life where the enemy seems to be in control. Our minds, our wills, our emotions, certain physical functions, our sexual area. Sometimes it has to do with our character. We're angry people. We're bitter we're full of jealousies and envies, things that, similar things. And I tell her, brethren, it's time we rose up, probably in anger against Satan. Amen? And told him in no uncertain terms, enough is enough. Set it as your goal to be free. I'm not going to say that in this camp you're going to get all your freedom. But you can get a great measure of it. Amen? Some of you will be here through Monday. It might do you good to start fasting. Saturday. Sunday and then be go through deliverance on Monday. Three days. Huh? Boy, you're quiet. I don't seem to, you don't seem to approve of my plan. Well, that's between you and the Lord. Amen. But let me tell you something, brethren. Let's set it as our goal to get as much deliverance at it as is possible in this life. To be free from all those things that I mentioned at first. To let no one, nothing, Keep us from enjoying the glorious liberty of the Son. Amen? Are you going to do that? Okay, let's just close our eyes for a moment. Why don't you make a vow before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not going to stop short. I'm going to press on. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for my freedom. I'm going to seek your face in prayer and fasting until I come into that fullness, and that reality of liberty that has been granted to us through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. God wants you free of physical infirmities. God wants you free of evil habits. God wants you free of personality disorders. God wants you free of emotional hang-ups. God wants you free of ancestral curses. God wants you free of soul ties. God wants you free of so many things that are keeping you back, holding you back, that are restraining you, that, that are putting the brakes on you so that you cannot come in to that life of service for God and for his kingdom. You'll never come into sonship until you're free. You'll never come into holiness until you're free. You'll never come into effective service for Christ and for his kingdom until you're free. And I would encourage you, brethren, to not let the months and the years go by. Set a date. You could say, by the end of this year, I'm going to be free, no matter what it takes. But set a date in your heart and mind. Say, Lord, I'm going to fight against all the powers of darkness until I'm free. Amen? Father, we thank you for this word that encourages Once again, makes us realize that you've provided through the Lord Jesus Christ the answer to all our spiritual, moral, and physical problems. We know, Lord, that the salvation that Christ wrought on the cross of Calvary is sufficient for all our needs. And yet, Father, we're satisfied with so little. We so easily stop short of the goal that you have set before us. Help us now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to awaken to the fact that we desperately need to be set free. 
We need healing for our bodies and for our souls and for our spirits. We need to be delivered and restored from all the effects of Satan's original sin, of Satan's fall. We ask you, Lord, that all the effects of sin, both temporal and eternal, will be dealt with severely in our lives, and that we can come into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We ask you for this privilege of being free from all entanglements, from all oppressions, from all harassments of the enemy, so that we can be true witnesses of Jesus Christ in these end times. Now bless each and every person that is here this afternoon, Lord, and if they have made a promise, if they've made a vow, help them carry through, that your Holy Spirit will quicken this decision and bring it to life and bring it uh, to fulfillment. I ask your blessing upon your people so that we can be a blessing to this world. There are so few people out there that even understand deliverance, Lord. Help us not only to understand it and experience it, but be ready and able to minister deliverance to the captives so that your people will be set free in this generation, in this final uh, or terminal generation, so that when Jesus comes, we'll be able to enter your kingdom and be of service to the Father and to the Son in the glorious ages to come. We ask it in Jesus' name for the glory of God. Amen and amen. How many can praise the Lord? Amen. Thank you, brethren, for the privilege of sharing with you. And I trust that I did, well, didn't belabor the point, but let's go forward into full freedom. Don't forget the literature back on the table. We're going to pray for the food. Father, we ask your blessing upon the food that it will be nourishment to our bodies as we have already received the nourishment for our souls. We ask you to bless the kitchen crew. We ask you to make this food palatable and uh, nourishing that will be strengthened not only in our spirit but in our body for future service. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.